So until now, we've been talking about pieces that, um, in addition to their use in China, about which we know not so much yet, uh, were exported to various parts of the world in bulk and selected by people lucky enough to receive them and used however those people chose to use them. This is a piece which is a little bit different in that it's made, it's commissioned specifically for use in Thailand by the king of the Chakri dynasty, Rama V. And you see his monogram written on the side of the jar in multiple times, starting with a very small version up at the top going down, and also on the lid. Um, we have very detailed records about this commission, which took place in 1888, was handled by a merchant of Chinese origin living in Bangkok, who was able, because of his knowledge of language, to interact with whoever was accepting the commission at the kilns in Jingdezhen and order lots and lots of very nice wares for use in the palace. This is a bottle for drinking water, and it's a shape that goes way, way back in Southeast Asia, ultimately to the use of gourds for holding drinking water. But there are many uh, stoneware versions, earthenware versions made over quite a few centuries before this late 19th century one. So, one part of this bottle is echoing deep um, Southeast Asians, uh, Thai in particular traditions. The other part is stealing the decoration from standard Chinese blue and white. So we have a motif called the Three Plenties. We have a pomegranate with all the multiple seeds that's reflective of fertility. We have a peach, which is a symbol of longevity. And we have what's called a Buddha's hand fruit, which is a fragrant uh, citron that's often used in China as New Year's gifts and has many positive connotations. And on the lid, there's five bats, ah. which are symbolic of the five blessings. So the motifs then come from China and have been translated uh, or reinterpreted in their new uh, destination. We also thought it might be fun to look at the style. Let me find the peach because the peach shows this quite well. The peach here if you look at the way this has been painted, and we know then this is 19th century, in style, you see stippling of the cobalt to make this effect of little dots. Why? Where did that concept come from as being such a handsome way to decorate blue and white porcelain? So when you look at a shape like this, decoration like this with uh, Chinese motifs, blue and white, it would be very easy, if you didn't know how to interpret the inscription, to think possibly this was part of the mass of amounts of blue and white that were sent and collected in Europe. So in our own peacock room, if you've read on the web or been to the room, you'll see that we did not have enough Kangxi period blue and white porcelains. So we commissioned some reproductions, some props to be used to fill out the shelves. At one point, different people were working on choosing the blue and whites that would be reproduced for the shelves. When there was an individual who was not deeply steeped in the history of blue and white, the individual fell in love with this pot. So asked for it to be reproduced in order to put on the shelves of the peacock room. And I walked by and I said, what is the pot for the Thai king doing being reproduced for the London dining room of Leyland? 
And so we had a good laugh over it and pulled those reproductions. Of course, they're not in the peacock room now. But the point it makes is that you really have to, I mean, the three of us feel that we're all still learning. And we've spent, you know, decades looking at porcelain. And you have to know a lot about shapes, motifs, inscriptions, uh, and trade markets before you can put the complex story together. We're going to end our session by taking you back to an earlier piece, a 15th century imperial Chinese piece that has that feature. So we're moving on to a pot that we know was commissioned by an emperor when Jing Dejun was the site of an imperial kiln supplying the court. Blue and white was never the court's favorite, most esteemed material, but it is a material that they cared a lot about. There were a lot of major innovations, which we'll talk about. And let me get this in the right direction. This is a piece that bears a rain mark. So the name of the Xuanda Emperor, 1426 to 35. So this is Xuanda. Mm. Now there are reproductions of such pieces made, but the three of us are absolutely positive this one is authentic. So we now actually have a date. We have a benchmark for this. Mm -hmm. And in relationship to the piece we just looked at, we thought we would show you where this heaped and piled technique comes from. So this is the stippling technique on the Thai piece, or the piece for the mm -hmm. Thai um, king, which is in imitation of a natural effect you see on Ming, sort of early Ming, blue and white, like this one, where there are areas where you can see it's quite dark, and that is iron that has passed through the glaze that's associated with the cobalt, and it leaves these black and brown marks. But in order to imitate that effect, they use stippling as a technique to give the same idea on a piece from the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about this piece is in some ways the decoration is very robust. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, this shape is very delicate, it's very lightweight, it's the lightest piece we've handled today. It has a stellar quality. The background, the white porcelain, is very snowy white. You have just an exquisite quality. And the way they've arranged the motifs actually emphasizes the beauty of the porcelain because you see these flowers are separated. So you can see a lot of white space showing around the individual motifs, which is absolutely typical of the imperial blue and white from the early Ming period. Hmm. But why bring something like this into today's discussion that has a theme of export? Although there are very few pieces like this that were going into Europe in the early period, we have a couple paintings that date to around 1500, such as one in the Getty by Magtanya of adoring uh, the Christ child. And in one of the paintings, you see Casper holding a blue and white, not exactly this shape, but similar in quality and decoration. He's holding that filled with gold coins and presenting it to the Christ child as the gift. So it's interesting to remember that blue and white had been encountered in Europe from quite an early time but it didn't become mass produced and shipped in large quantities until significantly later. And it comes into um, what is what later became Italy through the Medici family. And that of course would be the association with the great painter Mantegna. So while there weren't a lot of them available at that time, they did have access to these Italian you know, aristocratic collection. And I believe it was Lorenzo de' Medici who had quite a large collection of blue and white, um, which possibly might have supplied the piece that Mantegna painted. Mm -hmm. 
So it all connects together, and we hope you've enjoyed this session.